Right. Um, so our next presenter is Paul Rafferty. And he's going to talk about how do space heating wa hot water systems operate in practice and give us some insights from 300 buildings he's been working on or, and collecting data with. Um, you know, it's kind of a quick intro to that. I, hot water systems and controlling temperatures and making them more efficient is near and dear to my heart because we at, at my college, we installed condensing boilers on our campus back about uh, six, eight years ago and never saw a drop in what we thought would be a, a large drop in energy consumption. As a result of that, we went from standard fish boilers to condensing boilers. And what we're finding, I'm using my classes to, to investigate it, is that the system, they installed the condensing boilers, but they whoever designed it didn't bother to take the steps of looking at the return temperatures coming back and making sure that all the different water loops we're bringing back as low return temperature as possible so we can make and take advantage of the higher efficiencies at the lower return water temperatures. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Paul, and let you dig on in. Thanks, Ted. Um, I think that's a very common problem um, that we see a lot of in this data that you just did. Let me see if I can share the right screen here. So are you seeing the uh, full screen version there? Yes, we are. Thank you. Ah, great. I'll go ahead. Um, so thanks for the introduction. And thank you, Jessica, for, for a fascinating talk on FDD systems. There's a, a lot of crossover between that and some of the measures we're talking about here. Um, so um, today I'm going to be talking mainly about space heating hot water systems in large commercial buildings. Uh, and there are a lot of folks involved in this work. It's part of um, uh, California Energy Commission funded research project that's we're about halfway through at this point. And there are several different kind of scope elements of that project. Today, I'm only really going to be talking about two. One is um, measuring distribution losses from heating hot water systems in the field, and then gathering lots of data from these systems from different organizations and analyzing that data um, to yield insights that we can use to save energy. So um, the first one is looking at these distribution losses in the field. And um, some background here is just what, what are these distribution losses that we're talking about? So essentially we're talking about the heat lost from the hot water piping that is distributed throughout the building, just basically the heat required to keep that piping warm and maintain um, hot water at all of the end uses at all of the reheat coils and baseboard uh, devices in the building. Um, generally speaking, in analysis, these losses are assumed to be zero. ASHRAE 90.1 actually requires that these piping losses shall not be modeled. But even from first principles, we know they're not zero. There are some quantifiable amount. And in practice, in real buildings, you have lots of sections of piping that look like this. Even in new buildings, there are sections of completely uninsulated piping and valves. So the question is, how much are these in reality? And that's what we sought to to find out. So um, we developed a method where essentially we shut off all of the end use equipment, like uh, all of the air handling units during unoccupied periods. We close all of the valves on reheat coils, on baseboards, and then we operate the pumping system at basically how it's normally operated at the same temperature and pressure set points and flow set points. Um, and what we do is we measure the heat required by the boiler, or by the district hot water system to maintain that set point, the hot water supply temperature set point at a, at a, at a constant rate. And we average that over time. Um, now, there are some wrinkles to that depending on the, the, the type of the system that was involved and some constraints that I, I won't be getting into today, but that's conceptually at a high level what we are, um, what we are doing here. And one limitation is that we we're using the existing instrumentation in these buildings, which was of variable quality. In some cases, it was very high quality. In some cases, it was, it was older equipment. Um, we studied seven buildings so far. All of them are in California, but they're all pretty large um, commercial or academic office buildings for the most part, um, primarily with single duct um, VAV systems and hot water reheat. Uh, you can see a few pictures there. And what we found from this initial study was that um, what you're looking at here 
uh, and that's supply water temperature on the x-axis and uh, the actual losses normalized against the building floor area on the y-axis. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of scatter in this data from these seven buildings. But if you just take the, the average um, result here, the, the distribution losses just from the hot water piping is about 0.4 BTUs per hour per square foot. To put that in context, that's about 40% of average office plug loads in the United States, according to the GSA. Um, I don't think anyone would characterize that as negligible, though it's certainly not an enormous amount. It's, I doubt that people would consider it negligible. Um, on the instrumentation side, we did have three of those seven buildings where the instruments were really high quality. They were installed very recently, either as part of a retrofit or as part of this project um, by members of the research team. And the results from the new meters are comparable to those from the old meters. Um, I think the other factors affecting the variation uh, have a much bigger impact than the instrument uncertainty here. Um, and of course, we did some testing in, in some of the buildings where we ran the heating hot water system at lower supply water temperatures than they normally operate at, just to verify that we could measurably decrease the losses from decreasing supply water temperature. And we were able to do that for two of the sites here. So, as I mentioned, the losses aren't high, right? 0.4 BTUs per hour per square foot is a fraction, a tiny fraction of the peak design load for um, the heating hot water plant. That would typically be somewhere between 10 and 30 BTUs per hour per square foot in, in relatively mild climates. Um, the big difference, though, is that these losses occur continually, right? Every time that system is at temperature, they're happening all of the time. And we know that heating hot water systems operate at very low loads for the vast majority of the time as well. It's all exceptionally rare to hit that peak load profile. So what happens is, though the losses are low, because they're continuous, they actually can make up a substantial portion of the annual heating load on your heating plant. Um, for five of these buildings, we actually have the annual data from the instrumentation we have in there. And you can see that the losses range from somewhere between 6% in one of the buildings to 60% in another of the buildings. And that, that variation is due to um, some of the buildings having very high heating loads. They have like a really old envelope, single pane windows, whereas others have newer, uh, newer construction, better insulation, and also some of the controls and strategies that are in place there. So um, it's something to be considering in, in any of the buildings you're working on, um, and if, whether you're an operator or a designer. So we have a couple of recommendations for folks. Um, one is that for existing buildings, this is a really simple and quick test to do. You can effectively get results overnight or over a weekend. And the solution, at least partial solution, is also quite quick. You just implement the um, uh, lower hot water supply temperature or an actually functioning hot water supply temperature reset. Uh, to give some context, based on the data we have in a, in a 100,000 square foot building, dropping the supply water temperature by 40 degrees for, for a substantial portion of the year will save about $3,000 or eight tons of CO2. Um, that's obviously very approximate. There's a lot of factors that go in there, but we wanted to give some context here. The potential issues you can run into is that some of these systems do leak when you lower the supply water temperature, due to, especially those in the older buildings, like 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. Um, and for that reason, many of these systems are operated 24-7 to avoid those leaks. Um, however, we would argue that we should fix those leaks systematically now rather than dealing with leaks throughout your building at the same time as you have some inevitable power failure or power outage or bump or pump or um, boiler failure. And then the other issue you can encounter is that you can have insufficient capacity in a small number of zones in the building when you go to these lower supply water temperatures. And you can address these for most of the year by implementing supply temperature reset strategies, um, or you can retro commission a lot of the times these issues are due to um, minor equipment failure uh, at, at, at specific zones or incorrect, say, airflow set points or something like that. And you can even consider installing small supplemental heaters in, the, um, in a small number of zones. Think about you know, corner offices with undersized heating coils. Um, and the actual cost of operating those electric heating devices, even though it's resistance, 
electricity you, that you're using for heating is actually quite small relative to the overall savings um, within the whole building. Uh, in new construction, I think it makes sense to consider these losses as part of your analysis, and it gives you one more reason to design to low supply water temperatures. Um, designing to low supply water temperatures inherently means you'll get lower return water temperatures and your, get, your heating plant will operate much more efficiently. It also sets you up for inevitable, in my opinion, electrification of heating end uses in buildings. So whether you're designing for a heat pump system or a boiler today, um, you should be designing to 130 anyway, because either you will have a condensing boiler or in the future, someone is going to want to use a heat pump to service that load. And it will be much easier to do so if all of the thermal equipment is sized for 130. Um, and there are other things you can do as a designer too, or as, a, as an owner, you can advocate for, for example, considering two pipe systems with seasonal shutdown or changeover piping. That will allow you to, um, if effectively, it means that the losses happen within the envelope at the right time of year that they have a minimal effect. Right now, these losses are generally happening throughout the year. So even in, in the summer, you pay for it twice, right? You pay for the heat to heat up the hot water that gets lost in the building, and then you pay your, for your chill water and electricity consumption to reject that heat from the building. It's only really in the, the depth of winter when your air handlers are in primary heating that the losses have a negligible effect. Um, and two pipe systems uh, basically that will allow that to happen kind of more naturally than uh, continuously operating systems. And you can also design to reduce piping losses by minimizing the amount of piping in buildings using multiple risers instead of a single riser and floor level distribution on every single floor. All right. So the other component I wanted to chat about today was um, some insights we're, we're getting from uh, the second part of this project, which was really digging into data from lots and lots of heating hot water systems um, from different organizations. So the motivation here was to try and find places where how we assume these systems operate and how they actually operate differ in reality and see what opportunities there are to um, reduce emissions. Um, through that exercise. So what we need to do this is basically lots of data. We, we need at least a year, preferably several years of data at kind of five or 15 minute intervals from hundreds of buildings. Uh, on the right here, you're seeing uh, a time series plot of one of the data sets from one building, just to give you an idea of what we're looking for. So we're essentially seeking out supply and return water temperature and flow so that we can actually measure things like the delta T and the hot water load on the actual system. We also gather lots of other information like uh, pump speeds, differential pressures, firing rates, um, but that isn't as essential as just the supply temperature, return temperature and flow. But of course, no public data set exists for this. So we had to go out and create one, which was uh, a really mammoth task here. Uh, we reached out to hundreds of contacts nationwide and screened literally thousands of buildings. And in the end, ended up downloading data from about 300 buildings over 40 different organizations. And uh, now we have a lot of data. And the way I like to think about it is we have about 700 years worth of heating hot water system operation over the uh, um, entire data set. Um, so we're only just getting to the point of finishing cleaning up and organizing that data. Most of the effort so far in the project has been gathering it, as you can imagine. Um, but I wanted to share some of the kind of high level um, characteristics of the data and some of the early analyses that we're seeing uh, that we're doing at the moment. So first off, after we kind of go through some additional cleaning steps, we have to drop a few of the buildings. At the moment we're down to about 260. And you can see we have a pretty good distribution of floor areas there. Most of these are large commercial buildings, as I mentioned. The median is kind of around 70 or 80,000 square feet. Um, and then the year of construction spans from the 1800s up to today. Um, many of these buildings are kind of around the 1950s to 1980s. So they're at the very beginnings of kind of automation. A lot of them still have pneumatic systems. A lot of them have very, very dated automatic, automated um, automation systems if they have DDC at all. Um, and that is pretty typical of the, of the data set out there. Um, in terms of building type, 
Uh, we have a lot of offices, whether they're commercial offices or academic ones. We have a decent fraction of labs. Uh, and then the rest I would generally characterize as other, everything from medical offices and libraries to gymnasiums, um, stadiums and event spaces. The heating hot water systems, um, we have about 80 or so buildings with boilers of various kinds, and then the rest are district heating hot water systems. And that's just a function of um, the fact that we got more buildings from organizations that had um, kind of a centralized data acquisition system, and those also tended to have district hot water or steam systems as well. Uh, and then the buildings are distributed across the US, though many are in California. The main climates are climate three and climate four, and we have a, a couple in, in other climate zones with some unknowns for um, anonymously donated data. So there's a lot of questions we can ask from this, and I didn't want to turn this into a, a boiler talk. Um, um, and, and one of them is exactly the, the question you, you asked Ed, um, about what are, you know, how often are boilers condensing in practice? I don't have slides on that, but um, that will be at the next presentation. Um, for this presentation, I just wanted to focus on something at a very high level, and that is how often do heating and hot water systems operate in practice in real buildings, right? Um, so you might think, if you sit back and think about it, you might think office buildings typically operate, the HVAC operate should operate from maybe 12 hours a day, Monday to Friday. That would be 35% of the hours of the year. Even if you extend that to 10 p.m. and work it on Saturdays, the building should be, that's about 57% of the year. But of course, these are real buildings. This isn't an energy model. Um, so there are, you know, should be shutdowns for holidays, maintenance, major renovations over the course of this many buildings. Um, and of course, on the other hand, there should be some buildings that operate 24 seven, particularly labs and things like that. And, we should see a, a reaction that in, especially in the more extreme climates, that there is less operation during the summer and more during the winter. But the reality is that these systems are operating way too frequently in practice. Um, this is a, a, a distribution of um, the number of buildings against the fraction of the hours that they spend operating in the entire year. And the median system operates 75% of the hours of the year in this data set, which is uh, probably at least at least at least a third or maybe a half more than we expected to see even in the worst case. You would think that summer would be substantially better, but it, that actually only drops the median to 70%. And if you just think about that for a second, um, two thirds of the, the buildings in this data set have heating hot water systems that operate 12 hours a day on average including weekends in the summer. It, it doesn't make sense for normally occupied buildings and even after removing buildings like labs. So there's the good news here is that there's a lot of potential for energy savings. I'll get into that in a little bit in the future here. Um, I just wanna dive in into a little bit more detail to show you what um, some of the building data actually looks like. So this is one of the best buildings in the data set. Here you're seeing two plots. One is summer on the left and the other is winter on the right. And you're seeing the hour of day on the x-axis and the supply water temperature leaving the heating plant on the y-axis. Um, this, this building operates the heating hot water system 20% of the hours of the summer and 70% of the hours of the winter. Um, and even this building, right, it, it is you know, turning down and switching off in the summer, but there's, there's still plenty of room for improvement. The supply temperature reset, is present, but it isn't actually finding substantially lower water temperatures in the summer than it is in the winter. And there's a lot of unnecessary summer night operation. You could argue that for a, a, a normal occupancy office um, that it, it needs reheat it during, the, during the summer when it's occupied, but there's not really a justifiable reason for it to be operating at night when the air handlers are off in, in a summer um, setting. Um, looking at the, the same building, but instead of showing supply water temperature, now showing the actual measured load on the boiler, this is on the, the water side, not the gas side, um, you can see the uh, pretty uh, expectable results here. There's kind of a high morning winter peak 
um, on the right hand side and then there's kind of a low baseline load throughout the summer. But if you remember, um, we just finished measuring standby losses or distribution losses in seven other buildings. And what we found is that effectively most of the boiler load during the summer, not all of it, but the majority of it would be covered by that average um, distribution loss that we measured in those other buildings. In other words, the boilers are operating in the summer predominantly to service just heating up the hot water system as opposed to any genuine need in the building. And bear in mind, we are paying chilled water to actually um, reject those heat losses out of the building. So it's doubly uh, a double penalty, so to speak. And of course, this was one of the better buildings, right? Most of the buildings in the data set look like some version of this. They operate 90 to 95% of the hours of the year, and they have a pretty much static set point. Um, and that, that is something that is a clear indication of a problem and something that could be captured by systems like um, the fault detection systems that, that Jessica presented earlier. Um, so the, the good news is that there's huge energy and carbon savings potential here. Um, and it's from very simple measures, measures that can be done even in the absence of an in-depth fault detection system or even, even with an automation system that has very limited functionality, like you're thinking about your 20, 30 year old automation system. Um, measures like basic system scheduling, correcting zone airflow, uh, minimum airflows, correcting outside air controls and implementing guideline 36 resets in these buildings can have a cumulative effect that is very, very large. And that applies without having to do major equipment replacement, like replacing a boiler or switching out a boiler for a heat pump. Um, Taylor Engineering just finished the, the best in class project, another CEC project where they looked at doing full controls retrofits, where they actually take out the controllers in the building, replace them with new controllers and guideline 36 sequences. And they saw enormous measured energy savings in these buildings. So for example, taking out the pneumatic controls in an existing building and replacing them with modern controls was showing somewhere between 50 and 60% annual energy savings. And most of that was on the heating side in these buildings. Um, so that's the good news. The bad news is that it's not happening yet. And there's a lot of barriers and constraints to making that happen. For example, many of these measures are, are low cost, but they are harder to understand and, and fund than equipment or replacement. And they require engineering knowledge and attention to detail. It particularly things like zone minimum flow rates. That's something that's commonly uh, a, a very large problem, a very large energy consumer in buildings, but is almost never addressed in retro commissioning um, periods. Uh, and then the results from kind of implementing a lot of these measures will vary widely depending on the condition of the building and the quality of the extent of the implementation of these um, measures. And then there are a lot of constraints on the facilities and the operator side um, to actually, you know, have the time to make these, um, to implement these measures and have the focus because they have many different roles in a lot of these campuses. A lot, a lot of time training can be an issue as well, where it's, it's faster to override a set point than fix an underlying issue like leaks. And of course, there are some reverse in incentives here. Um, operators are frequently, their responsibility is primarily to satisfy the occupants, um, avoiding complaints on comfort, avoiding the potential risk of leaks or any disruption um, rather than energy savings. So we have to find a way to address these issues if we're gonna get substantial carbon savings and emissions reductions in the building stock. And um, we're really just at the beginnings of diving into this data set. Um, we're hoping to um, write up most of the more uh, detailed analysis in the next year. But I wanted to close out this presentation with a couple of uh, thoughts on decarbonization. So we're, we need to decarbonize our building stock to be able to meet our climate goals. Um, and many people have focused on electrification as the, the method for doing that. And I fully agree, we need to electrify these loads. But I wanted to give you three thoughts to think over. First of all is based on the best in class results, we're seeing that 
fixing these controls issues with full controls retrofits in the older buildings is going to reduce emissions by about the same amount as fully electrifying them, especially in um, grids that aren't as clean as California's. Um, fixing the controls will also make them cheaper and more feasible to electrify because we'll have lower loads to address and it will put less stress on grid infrastructure because we'll need less grid capacity to meet those loads after we um, fix these controls issues. But just something to focus on. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a couple of papers out that will be published at the upcoming ASHRAE conference. I'm happy to share those on request in advance of that if you like, just reach out to me by email. And of course, if you're a designer or an operator, you can try out these standby loss tests and um, let me know what you find. I'd be, I'd be very curious and we'd be happy to help with that process too um, if you have a building in mind. And um, with that, thank you for your attention and um, look forward to your questions. Yeah, Paul, um, so do you, do you have a resource for setting up those standby loss tests? Um, I, I would say just reach out to me directly and we'll walk you through the process. We have a paper that describes it in a lot more detail than the presentation, but as, as I say, I'm sure everybody in this call knows every building is, especially if you go looking at the span of 100 years, um, every building is pretty unique uh, in terms of what you actually will need to do to do that test. But conceptually, it's switch off all of the uh, hot water end users, turn off all the air handlers, and, and just pump water around your heating system and maintain the temperature. So a question um, regarding losses for a system that's not doing reheat, so you don't have summer loads, right? Mm -hmm. um, what percent of those losses go back into actually providing some heat for the building? That's a great question. Um, we, we looked at this in detail. Essentially, if, you're, if your losses are occurring at a time when the building itself is in primary heating, then they are essentially negligible. Um, so for if you think about where the losses occur, they're usually in the return air path in some context. Um, so they go back up to the air handler and unless the air handler is at minimum outside air and the heating coil is on, those are rejected in the relief air. So for many buildings, that's somewhere between around freezing temperatures. So if you have a heating hot water system in a building, that doesn't have reheat, that is like baseboard or something like that. Um, when, when the air handlers are, are um, in heating mode, then you basically are, the losses are negligible. But from the data that we gathered, many of those heating hot water systems are still running 24 seven, 365 days a year, even when they're baseboard systems because of concerns, whether real or perceived about leaks. Um, and that, that those concerns are, are, are more frequent and common in the older buildings that tend to have those systems. So a lot of those district systems we saw had, um, had heating hot water systems that were on 24 seven. So they were paying twice for those losses in summer months when, when the yeah. air handlers are above economizer lockout. Um, you know, and we even have anecdotal evidence from one, one study where the, 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 the team shut off the, um, the uh, hot water system during the summer and like was able to observe a noticeable drop in the chiller loading two hours later compared to normal operation. It's, um, it's, I think it's just one of those things that people ignore. You, you just pump water around the building and you don't think about the fact that there are losses from the actual piping and all of those uninsulated valves. Yeah. Well, um, I hate to cut it off here, but we need to move on to the next sure. presenter. Thank you very much, Paul. Really appreciate your time. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn over to the next person.